If you're interested in jazz guitar, and in particular, if you're interested in chord melody, which is a style for solo jazz guitar, where you take a song and you play the melody, and you also play some harmony, some chords beneath the melody, and get all of that going at the same time. If that's, if that's something that you're interested in, then I want to recommend uh, this book uh, by my friend Tim Lurch. It's called The Melodic Jazz Guitar Chord Dictionary. What I really like about this book is that it is organized in a way that's quite different from any other chord dictionary that I've seen. Mostly when you have a chord dictionary, they tend to either be organized by root, like here's C major, here's C minor, here's C diminished, here's C augmented, here's C7, and so on, or organized by quality. Here's a bunch of pages of major seven type chords. Here's a bunch of pages of minor seven type chords and so on. Uh, what Tim did that I think really makes this a different sort of book is that it's organized by melody, by the melody note on top of the chord. So for example, if you wanted to play C major seven and you wanted to have E as the melody note, uh, that's the third of the chord, uh, you could find several options for that specific situation. If you're wondering how that could be useful in practice, uh, I want to show you. So we're going to take this tune, uh, Someday My Prince Will Come. Uh, maybe you know it. This is a page out of the real book. Quick side note before we go any further. When you see music written like this, and it's not coming out of a book that's specifically for the guitar, but it's just a general purpose music book, we're always going to take the melody up an octave from where it's written. Why? Because the guitar, whether you know it or not, is actually a transposed instrument. Uh, everything we play sounds an octave lower than we think. Uh, this F... On the guitar, most guitar players would play that on the D string, the fourth string at the third fret. And if a piano player saw that, that same note and went over and played it on the piano, it's going to sound an octave higher than what we're playing on the guitar. And uh, I hate to break it to you, but the piano player is not wrong. So uh, in order to bring the guitar into line with uh, where concert pitch is, we're going to take everything up an octave. So this F, we're not going to play it on the D string. We're going to either play it first string, first fret, or second string, sixth fret. There's other places you could play it, but, but let's start there. Now, you need to know a little bit of music theory to follow along here, but it's nothing too advanced. Uh, we want to figure out this F, what does it have to do with B flat major seventh? Well, it turns out it's the fifth. B flat, C, D, E flat, F. F is the fifth of B flat major seven. What, what we're really saying is that B flat major seven, that comes out of a B flat major scale. What is the fifth note of that scale? It's F. So you could look at this and through the lens of Tim's book, you would want to say that this is a major type of chord with the fifth on top. And then we're going to have to decide which string we want to play it on. So let's say we'll play it on the second string. That's at the sixth fret. If we keep going, uh, the next note is B flat. Remember, we want to take it up an octave. Uh, what does B flat have to do with D7 sharp five? Well, B flat is the sharp five. You could also say it's the flat six or flat 13, but uh, for the purposes of this, let's just say that it is the sharp five. So you would look in Tim's book and you would look for uh, the section on uh, altered dominant chords, sharp five on top. And uh, where do you want to locate this? Because within each section, there's uh, several voicings with the root or not the root, with the melody note on the third string, the second string, the first string. Almost always in chord melody, the melody will be on strings one, two, or three. 
we're, we're not going to have the melody on lower strings because then we, we can't put much harmony uh, under a note that's on the fifth string. Since we're already at the sixth fret on the second string for F, let's play this B flat on the first string at sixth fret. Let's not worry about the F sharp right now. We're just going to think in broad strokes here. So uh, next note is A. So we need to know what does A have to do with E flat major seven? It's the sharp 11. So we go to Tim's book in the table of contents. We find major type chords, sharp 11 in the melody. And since it's right next to this B flat, we'll stay on the first string. So second string, sixth fret, uh, first string, sixth fret, first string, fifth fret. And then uh, this G, we can go back to the second string and play that at the eighth fret. And that is an altered dominant chord root in the melody uh, played on the second string. So now with the guitar in hand, uh, that's going to give us just the melody first. Now I'm going to show you three examples uh, using these four bars, the first four bars of Someday My Prince Will Come, uh, with all, all with voicings that I got right out of Tim Lurch's book, uh, following the same process that I showed you. Here's example one. I'm going to play these slowly, really out of tempo, uh, just to let you hear the sound of each chord. So here's example one, B flat six. D7 flat 9 sharp 5, E flat major 13 sharp 11, G7 sharp 5 over F, it just means that F is the lowest note. So one more time. Here's example 2. I see. Uh, so this is B flat six nine, D D seven flat nine sharp five over C. If it's hard for you to hear this as a D chord, maybe let let your pinky off so you can hear that D. Or you can grab it down here. We we don't want to play it when when we're playing the example, but if it helps you get centered with what the real sound of that is, that's fine. And then, I don't know if you can see, but I'm actually getting my first finger in two different frets here. This is E flat at the sixth fret, A at the fifth fret. So it's kind of like B flat major seven with E flat as the, as the bass note. And then instead of G7 sharp five, I'm playing G7 flat five. I've got the flat five in the bass, the root of the dominant chord up top. So one more time. Finally, here's example three. Starts off uh, very plain, just B flat, no extensions or color. Then D7 flat nine sharp five over F sharp. So you could sort of think of it coming out of this grip, but we're we're leaving the bass note off just just because. If you if you want to hear it, you can play it. And then this E flat major seven, again, uh, with this slant finger. So it's just like your basic E flat major seven, but with the sharp 11 up high. And uh, this G seven, I'm flattening out my middle finger across three strings and then getting the G up here with my ring. There might be another way to play that. that this is the most comfort comfortable for my hands. Comfort is relative. So that's how I would use this book and how I recommend that you 
use it would be to pick a tune or a piece of a tune and uh, try some things out, see what works. Uh, I, I made those three exercises pretty quickly. If I wanted to spend a little more time, I might find that, oh, actually, the second voicing in, in example one, maybe that voice leads better going into, you know, the third chord in the third example. Or, you know what I mean? Like, you could try mixing and matching. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't fuss with it too much. I just wanted to move quickly and make some music, which I think is a good, good way to do anything, um, especially if you're feeling stuck. Just do something. And uh, you can always go back and make it better, but if you have nothing, you can't, you can't make nothing better. You have to have something. So I made these examples. Uh, I might go back and work on them some more or find some other voicings from the book that, uh, that hang together in, in a way that, that I like more. Or, or, or maybe not. Maybe, maybe I just got lucky and, uh, and it's perfect as is. That's, that's always a possibility. I think this book works great as a resource, something to keep on the shelf that you can turn to when you're looking for something specific. It's also a way that I would like you to think, to actually organize chords in your mind so that you think of them from the melody down rather than from the bass or root up. One of my students is working on Wes Montgomery's arrangement of The Days of Wine and Roses. Uh, a couple bars in, there is this chord, which in the book is listed as, I think, E flat major seven sharp 11, and it's got the B flat and the bass. And, uh, he found that chord really hard to play, and so he looked either in a chord dictionary or online, I'm not sure where, and found some other ways to play E flat major 7 sharp 11. So uh, I think one of them might have been this. Uh, I think one of them was this. And they didn't sound good to him, and they don't sound really great to me either. I mean, out of context, they sound fine, but uh, what he was missing is exactly the point of, of what this book is all about, which is that he wasn't keeping the melody note on top. Just looking for an alternate E-flat major 7 sharp 11 voicing isn't going to get you anywhere near to that. Uh, so if you see a chord in a, in a book or a transcription that you can't play, try leaving the lowest note off. Well, you might say, well, why didn't Wes leave that off? Well, if you think about his technique, it's with his thumb. Uh, doing this lets him get a big sound with just, I don't know if you can see that, but just going across the strings. Otherwise, you know what I mean? He, like, he can't skip strings, really. He's got to play something kind of physically big to do this, even though the, the A string is being muted. Right? So you can always, in practice, leave that note off, or you could play maybe just the two outside notes if your technique allows you to do that. Um, but whatever you do, if you need to simplify or abbreviate, don't sacrifice the melody note. The melody note is, uh, is always, is, that's always the sacred text, you know? So there you go. Uh, check out Tim's book. Think about the way that you organize chords in your mind and, uh, think about what you might need to adjust to your own, uh, limitations. If you're working on something, uh, from a book or a transcription that you're having a hard time with. Do you have a favorite chord book? If you do, I would love to know about it. Uh, please leave it in the comment section down below. And of course, if you enjoy this channel, make sure to like, subscribe, uh, get yourself a t-shirt or a coffee mug to help support the channel. I appreciate you.